Well, hello again. Uh, this is Revelation class, and today we will be going through Revelation chapter 2, verse 12 to 17. So, if you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation 2, verse 12, and uh, let us pray. Lord, uh, we thank you for this day. Thank you for this time. I uh, thank you again that we come together, even if we're not physically together, Lord. Um, I pray that you just uh, speak to us this morning. Let us have open ears, open hearts, and open minds to what you have to say. We thank you in your son's name. Amen. <clears throat> All right, let us read the text. Revelation 2, verse 12 to 17. To the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things, says he who has a sharp two-edged sword, I know your works and where you where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name, and do not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold to the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold to the doctrine of, of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come, come to you quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone on the stone, a new name written with which no one knows except him who receives it. So as uh, per usual, we'll go through a bit of history of the city, uh, talk maybe a couple things about the church, and then we'll move on to the, to the text. Um, so uh, if, again, if you want to look at uh, the slides, there are slides on this uh, church on the Moodle, feel free to pause the video or download it while, while you're listening to the video, and uh, we'll go from there. Um, but today we have the Church of Pergamos. Pergamos is uh, the city, um, and it's some translators uh, translate it as Pergamum. Now, that is the, the neutered conjugation, whereas per pergamos is the feminine word. So basically, it's the same word, just different conjugations. Uh, both are recognized as the official city name. Now, as mentioned, uh, when we went through the letter uh, uh, to the church in Ephesus, uh, Pergamos is the capital of Asia, the capital of this region. Now, um, and Pergamos had been the capital for over 400 years. Um, and uh, what's interesting is Pergamos had, uh, had been the capital of Asia even before the Grecian Empire. No, sorry, let me just pull up these notes here. Um, I was trying something different and I didn't like it. <laughs> um, just close that out and uh, put that on. <clears throat> now, uh, now, I don't know about you guys, but if you've ever been to the capital city, uh, whether it be Washington, D.C., Wellington, uh, or the capital of a country, there's a certain feel about that city. There's a certain political atmosphere that's there that may not be anywhere else in any of the other cities of that country. Um, and Pergamos certainly had that. Because it had been the capital city for so long, there was a certain swagger, a certain feel, a certain uh, atmosphere of Rome and Greece that cer certainly pervaded the citizens as well as the city. Uh, Pergamos was also the headquarters for Caesar worship. Now, Caesar worship... Uh, it, a couple of notes that we need to remember about Caesar worship is it actually began with the people, not with the Roman government. When, the, when Ro the Roman Empire came in, they ruled with a rod of iron, or with, a, or with an iron fist, really. And they basically said, submit or else. And, but as they came in, they brought peace and stability. Uh, to these nations. And this region had been at war, it had been at chaos, they had been at odds and fighting. There was a bit of civil war going on uh, within that area before Rome came in. 
Now, because of this, people willingly wanted to recognize the Roman Empire uh, that brought this peace, that brought the Roman peace, Roman Paxa. And it began as a form of honor to the empire as, as a whole. They would give gifts, they would donations, there was a bit of worship or whatever to the empire as a whole. But then the Roman Empire uh, was looking for something to unify the, the, the land, unify the nation, unify the empire. And as they were looking for something to unify, um, because you can only rule with an iron fist for so long, you can rule with that before you, uh, only to, to bring an initial peace, but then shortly after you begin to look like a dictatorship, you look, you begin to, uh, reveal, um, that it's all one-sided, it's all about the empire and not about the people. So, Rome began to look for different things to unify the people. And as they're looking, as they, uh, they start seeing this, this, this empire worship, so the pe as, as the Rome started developing this or looking into this a bit more, it became mandatory that everyone worship or, or everyone in the Roman Empire would go to a temple once a year and burn a pinch of incense on the altar. And then they would proclaim Caesar as Lord. Now, the reason for proclaiming Caesar as Lord is because Caesar is the one who embodied the empire. He was the one who sort of um, rallied the troops, if you will, much like a prime minister or, or a president. Uh, so there was nothing significant in that except for he was the head. He was the one who was making the nation move forward. Now... Uh, <clears throat> But as, as Caesar worship began to get a bit developed, it began to get corrupted. Uh, certain Roman officials and Roman governors and even, even Roman emperors began to corrupt what was something that was there to honor Rome into something that was now manipulated into abusing the people to some extent. A couple of things as we keep this in mind. First, as mentioned, Caesar worship was all about it started by the people giving gratitude to Rome, and then it became more political. It got manipulated into political moves. But second thing is it wasn't exclusive. Caesar worship wasn't all about worshiping only Caesar. Rome never cared about how many gods a person worshipped. They didn't even care about what gods a person worshipped, so long as it didn't disrupt uh, peace uh, the peace of the people, peace, you know, the peace within the nation. Even at the height of the wor of emperor worship, they only wanted people to do their duty, and then they were free to worship any other gods. You could go and burn a pinch of, pinch of incense, proclaim Caesar as Lord, and then walk away and go worship some other god. Third thing is the, uh, the main act of Caesar worship was proclaiming Caesar as Lord. For the Christians, the, proclaiming Caesar as Lord was something that they couldn't do because Lord was proclaiming that somebody other than Jesus Christ was Lord. And we can't do that. So because Christians wouldn't proclaim that somebody other than Christ is Lord, that meant that they were considered revolutionary, they were considered disloyal, they were even considered rebellious to Rome. Now, Rome never understood this because to Rome... Just proclaim that he's Lord, go off and then go worship Jesus. It's that, that simple, it's that easy. Um, but that the, to the Romans, those were just words. To us, that was designation of a title and significance to somebody who didn't deserve that. <clears throat> now, um, the city of Pergamos is still around today. It's called a Turkish, it's a Turkish city called Bergamo. There was a, uh, a university, or Pergamos was known as a university town. Um, Pergamos had this, also had the second largest library at that time. Uh, Alexandria in Egypt had the largest library, and Pergamos had about uh, 200 volume, two, sorry, 200,000 volumes of books or parchments or, or papyrus uh, or scrolls. <clears throat> now, Pergamos had... Uh, had made parchment popular for making books and writing. Uh, it was invented in Pergamos, but the reason it was invented was the king of Pergamos uh, wanted to make his library bigger. He wanted to make his the largest library. And so he thought, okay, in order to make my library bigger than Alexandrian's library, 
why don't we uh, bring the, the, the librarian from Alexandria to Pergamus? <clears throat> and, uh, but the Egyptian pharaoh found out, and he put a stop to that. He wouldn't allow the librarian to go. Um, he also put a stop to the export of papyrus, because before this time, papyrus was the main form of paper or, or uh, material to write on. And so at that point, that's when uh, Pergamus started making and or rather mass producing papyrus. Parchment was from Alexandria in Egypt. Papyrus was from, uh, <clears throat> oh, sorry, parchment is from Pergamus uh, and papyrus was from uh, Alexandria. Now, Pergamus was also a cult religious center of the time. Uh, it even considered itself the defender of Greek culture and the Greek way of life. Uh, there were two main shrines in Pergamos. Uh, the first was built uh, was a shrine built from the victory uh, of defending the from the invading Gauls around 240 BC. Now, once the battle was won, this shrine was built on a large rock on the Pergamos uh, conical hill. <clears throat> and it was in the in the figure of a giant seat or a throne, and it stood about 800 feet high, or that's 243 meters high. That's roughly about the same height as an eight-story building. Now, there was a fire burning on this throne all day and all night. It was a continual fire, and there were sacrifices to Zeus on this altar. <clears throat> and this altar or shrine was built in front of the temple Athena. So you have this massive seat or altar on this huge hill. Sorry, I'm still getting a, bit, a, a little bit over a cold, so uh, bear with me as I clear my throat and drink a lot of water and a bit of coffee. Sorry. Now, the second shrine was uh, to Asclepos, Asclepos, and he was the god of healing. Now, his temples were usually near hospitals, and people would uh, come from all over the ancient world to be healed. Now, the image of Asclepos was uh, that of a serpent, and we still have the impact of this god in the medical field today, and we see the serpent on a pole in pharmacies and hospitals around the world. There's also a connection back to when Moses put the, bra the serpent on a brass pole and raised it up <clears throat> when the children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness. But in the, in the temples of this god, there were non-venomous snakes uh, slithering around. And so the idea was you would spend a night in this temple, and these snakes would come, and they'd slither all over your body, and they supposedly helped heal people. Uh, there's also... Um, next to the, the temples, or somewhere near these temples, there would be these tunnels. And these tunnels were tunnels of healing attributed to this god. And you would walk into this tunnel, and about every 20 feet or so, uh, there was a hole, and, uh, and someone would be in that hole whispering truths to you as you walked past. And in reality, this is the f some, one of the earliest forms of psychotherapy, of speaking good and helping you to think that that, that, that truth or that good was uh, true about you. Now, um, Pergamos was, uh, the, it was called the illustrious city of the ancient times. Um, it, Pergamos could have, uh, it was never really, uh, could never really become as big uh, in the commercial sense as Smyrna or even Ephesus, but it was much greater in the cultural sense than both of those cities even combined. It was rich in vibrant culture and, and um, what it meant to be a Greek uh, at that point in time. And that was something that Ephesus and Smyrna never had. Now, the church uh, at Pergamos is considered or called the, the compromising church. Uh, the comes from two words, pergamos or pergamos, per means mixed or elevate, uh, evaluation, and gamos means marriage, so mixed marriage. There's a mixed marriage here. Now, there's no record of this church being established, uh, but it, as mentioned before, it's most likely established during um, the time of when Paul was in Ephesus. Um, and like the church at Smyrna in Acts 19, uh, verse 10. Now we come to verse 12, the, the description of Christ. 
<clears throat> and the angel of the church in Pergamos write these things says, He who has a sharp two-edged sword. Now, Jesus is described as the one who has a sharp sword. Now, this is the same sword, the same word for sword that is mentioned in Acts, or sorry, in Revelation 1, 16. It's a big sword. It's not a small sword like in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, but it is a large sword. It's a sword of judgment. It's a sword that was going to do some damage. Notice, he's the one who has the sword coming out of his mouth. Now, notice in verse 13 what Jesus says, I know your works, and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name, and did not deny my faith in the days in which Antipas, my faithful martyr, uh, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. So they've got some, this church has some significant uh, things said about it. He says, I know your works. Same, same words that are used in the other churches. I know what you're doing. I know what you have done. I can perceive it. I understand it. I, I've watched you from the outside looking in. But notice now Jesus talks about where you dwell or where they dwell. And notice he says they live or they dwell where Satan's throne is. Now that word there for dwell, it means to live or to dwell just as that. Uh, but it's a place of establishment. It's a place of permanent residence, if you will. Now the reference to Satan's throne has caused a, a bit of a debate, if you will. And there are several, several different ideas. Um, what, it, what does it mean that Satan dwells or lives in Pergamos? <clears throat> Notice it says... Um, some believe that this is a reference to the shrine of Zeus, that there's that seat, that throne, and so Satan's throne is actually a reference to Zeus's throne that has continual sacrifices. Um, others believe it's in connection to the tunnels that are attributed to the healing god Eclepos, uh, and yet others also believe that it's connected to the fact that uh, Pergamos was the epicenter or the headquarters of emperor worship. In, at that point in time, and they and, and some people even make the make the connection that Antipas was killed uh, because he did not worship uh, the emperor uh, in Caesar worship. But whether that's true or not, I'm not entirely sure. But the last idea, and I, this is the idea that I hold, is that all of these are true, and all of these are connected. That Satan had what would, what would be referred to as a stronghold in Pergamos. And therefore his throne is more of a figure of speech. And that was that, that, that's where his headquarters were, if you so speak, uh, was in Pergamos. The point of all of this is to show that Satan had a stronghold in Pergamos. And, and to some extent, I think if we look throughout church history and throughout history, we can see that Satan has a stronghold over different places or over different cities. And so at the time of writing this, Jesus is indicating that Pergamos was a stronghold of Satan. And you look at the, the, the shrine, the, the, the tunnels, the emperor worship, all of those things would seem to indicate that that is a possibility. Now, um, Something to note about Satan, <clears throat> and this should go without saying, but we'll say it anyways. Satan is not equal to God. He, this is not good versus evil in the sense of one being on par with the other. Satan, if, if Satan is here, he is not there, meaning that he is not omnipresent. So if Satan is in Pergamos, he is not in Ephesus or Smyrna or anywhere else in the world at that point in time. Now, yes, he does have minions that do his bidding. There is does seem to be a hierarchy or ranking, ranking within the demon realm, but demons are just fallen angels, and Satan is a fallen angel himself. They are created beings that are rebelling against God, an uncreated being. So this is not a, a, a fight that is on par with any other fight. This is a small rebellion, if you will, yes, has a large impact in the world, but according to the, in, in the view of the Lord, it's a small rebellion. So notice, the, they, those in the church of Eph uh, Pergamos, they hold fast to Christ's name. They hold fast, they hold strong, or to prevail, they hold on to his name. And, and we see that they, 
even in the midst of where Satan dwells, excuse me, sorry, where in the midst of where Satan dwells, they are holding on to Christ. They are not rebelling or rejecting or denying Jesus' name. Notice it even says they don't deny Jesus' faith or Christ's faith. Deny means to say that one is not related to another, to deny, to reject or disown. I love what G. Campbell Morgan says. He says the inference is that if there was any place that it might have been probable that these people should have ceased to hold his name, it would have been in these peculiar and difficult circumstances in which the church at Pergamum found itself at the time. The whole point is that if Jesus is saying that they held to his name, they didn't deny his faith, um, it almost implies that anybody else would have or could have, that the opportunity to deny Jesus was there. The opportunity to reject him was there, and, it, and even more so because of it being Satan's throne. Notice there's a faithful martyr, Antipas. Antipas means against all. Now, we're not sure what happened to Antipas. According to tradition, and, and that's pretty much all there is, Tertullian was roasted inside of a brass bowl, Tertullian being an early church father. And he was, and he was roasted inside of a brass bowl at Pergamos. It's possible that, that Antipas had the same thing happen to him, uh, he was, but he was killed where Satan dwells. Notice the word uh, witness means uh, martyr or, or, or to give testimony, to bear witness to someone. Um, now it's interesting that Christ gives Antipas a very interesting title, the title of faithful martyr. Now why is that interesting? Well, because that's the title that Christ carries as well in Revelation chapter 1 verse 5 as well as Revelation 3 verse 14. So Antipas is given a title that Christ carries for himself. Now, they're doing good. They're holding on, and, and it almost seems to imply they're holding on with everything that they've got to Christ's name. Now, what is it that's going wrong in this church? Notice verse 14. But I have a few things against you. You, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. So really, they have two things. There's two things that Christ had against them. The doctrine of, of Balaam, and the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Those two things are which are the things that Christ holds against this church. Notice it says that they held to the doctrine of Balaam. Balaam, what does it mean? Well, actually, it comes from two Hebrew words to conquer the people. Uh, Bala, uh, to conquer, and uh, Ham, the people. Notice it's the same meaning of the word Nicolaitans. Uh, Nicolaitans is the Greek form of the word Balaam, which is the Hebrew word. So Nicolaitans is Greek, Balaam is Hebrew, and they, basically, and they mean the same thing. Notice it says that they hold to this doctrine. Hold means to be strong or mighty. Notice, this is the same word that is used to describe Jesus holding the seven stars in his right hand in Revelation chapter 1. And it means that he's that nothing is coming out. They're holding with all authority and grasp that they can hold. And so the idea is that these doctrines are not something that they take lightly. They're something that they hold on to with all of their might, with all that they can have. But notice, it's not everyone who's holding on to this doctrine. It is only those who hold these things. So it's not everyone in the church. It's not everybody that is there. It's probably not even the, it would even seem that it's not including the leadership. Because notice that it's not the pastor or the leader that holds, but it would seem to be certain members of the church that hold this uh, doctrine. So what is the doctrine of Balaam? 
Well, if you go back to Numbers, Numbers chapter 22 to 25, so if you turn back to those chapters and read about Balaam, uh, you'll see that this is, this is Balaam who ultimately uh, rides the donkey and he's riding the donkey to meet King Balaam or Balak and the donkey is the one that stops and talks to Balaam. Um, but also we see that this is ultimately where uh, Balaam tries to do, he ends up doing three things. And, and and he does three things against Israel. Notice, firstly, he assumed that God would curse Israel. That was that was the first thing. Second thing is he sold his prophetic gift for money. And thirdly, he taught someone to stumble others, to stumble Israel. And if you go back to Numbers twenty-two to twenty-five, you'll hear you'll read the story of where basically Balak hires Balaam. Uh, Balak was the king of Moab. He hires Balaam to come and curse Israel. And Balaam says, "I can't do it. God won't let me." And Balak keeps enticing him. So he says, "Fine." So he goes and he tries to curse. And three times Balaam tries to curse Israel. And three times God actually changes Balaam's words so that he physically cannot curse the Israelites. So he ends up blessing them instead of cursing them. So when Balaam realizes and, and kind of gives up hope, he goes to Balak and says, look, I physically cannot curse them. God will not allow me to. But if you want to curse, if you want God to curse them, all you have to do is send your women into the Israelite camp to marry and have relations with the Israelite men. Then God will curse them. And that's it. So Balak pays Balaam and Balaam goes away. Balak sends the women, the Moabite women into, sorry, into the nation of Israel, and then God curses Israel because they uh, were uh, having relations with the Moabite women. So that leads to those three things. Firstly, Balak, or sorry, Balaam, uh, assumed God would curse Israel. He assumed that God would actually do that. Secondly, he sold his prophetic gift for money. And thirdly, he ends up teaching someone else to stumble others. Now, what's interesting is those three things that Balaam does leads to something uh, in the New Testament. There's a connection in the New Testament. We see that these three things pop up within the New Testament. Notice in verse in, in Jude chapter or sorry Jude eleven. There's only one verse. We see that um, Balaam assumed God would curse Israel. And we see it's referred to in Jude 11 as the error of Balaam. He believed that God would actually betray his chosen people. So th th that's an error or, or, of Balaam, is believing that God will betray his chosen people. Secondly, we see that he, Balaam, sold his prophetic gift for money. And we see that that's referred to as the way of Balaam. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 15, the way of Balaam, 2 Peter 2, verse 15, where he took money from a foreign king and tried to curse the people of God. And lastly, he taught someone how to stumble others, and that's referred to as the doctrine of Balaam. And that's what we have here in Revelation chapter 2, verse 14, that he told a foreign king to give the Gentile women to intermarry, intermarry or intermingle with the Jewish men. And this was how he would get God to curse the Israelites. So here we have Balaam put a stumbling block in front of Israel. Then the stumbling block is teaching someone else how to stumble, or sorry, the doctrine of Balaam is teaching someone else how to cause someone else to sin, basically. Stumbling block. It's the Greek word scandalon, and it means uh, it's the part of a trap or a snare that triggers the trap to catch an animal. It, it would be if you have a box and a stick and then the rope holding. It's the rope because as soon as the animal goes into the box, you pull the rope and it's that part. that It's the trigger of the trap, if you will. The word's found in Romans 11, 9, as well as 1 Corinthians 1, 23. John Wolver put this, put the doctrine, he explains the doctrine of Balaam this way. He says, the doctrine of Balaam, therefore, was the teaching that the people of God should intermarry with the heathen and compromise in the matter of idolatrous worship. 
Now it's sad because, as mentioned, Balaam tried to curse Israel three times. And yet three times God turned those blessings, or sorry, turned those cursings into blessings. So because it didn't work, Balaam told the king how to cause the children of Israel to stumble. So what does this have to do with the church of Pergamos? Notice that it's the doctrine of Balaam. So it deals with the teaching of others how to stumble. The doctrine means teaching or, or, or um, the study of. And so if someone is teaching someone else something, what are they teaching? The doctrine of Balaam, the ability to cause someone to stumble. Just as Balaam taught Balak to cause the Israelites to sin, so there are people in the church of Pergamos that are teaching others to sin. Now, there are two things that define the doctrine of Balaam that are here in the text. Notice in verse uh, 14, But I have a few things against you, because you have there are those who hold to the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of idols. Now here we go. To eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. So the doctrine of Balaam is specifically tied to eating things sacrificed to idols and committing sexual immorality. <clears throat> no, the first thing is eating things sacrificed to idol. We see Balaam and those in the church, particularly in the church of Pergamos, were dealing with things eating, eating things sacrificed to idols. Now, Paul deals with that in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 to 10, and he deals with the, the both sides of the argument. There's, there's no power in the idols, therefore we should be able to eat, the, but there, there are those who may cause us to stumble. We should be, uh, you know, uh, bear our, uh, keep in mind our weaker brethren. The underlying issue or concern should always be for the weaker brother. So the issue here of what's going on is that there are people in the church that are being stumbled by eating things sacrificed to idols, and therefore everybody's saying, it's okay, get over it. When in reality, if the weaker brother is being stumbled because of eating things sacrificed to idols, we shouldn't do it. We should stay away from it. And that's ultimately what Jesus is saying here. Now, um, Secondly, it deals with sexual immorality. And it would seem that the believers in the, in the Church of Pergamos were trying to say that it was okay to intermingle with non-believers or be sexually promiscuous. And, and we're not told to what extent, but either way, it would seem that there was it was okay to eat things sacrificed to idols, irrespective of what people believe, and it was okay to be sexually promiscu promiscuous. Now, what's interesting, or, or more, even more concerning, is that in Acts chapter 15, the church deals with those two things specifically, which is written before Revelation. So those two things, eating things sacrificed to idols and um, sexual immorality, were dealt with by the first church council in Acts chapter 15. They address specifically those two things, Acts chapter 15, verse 28, and 29. But notice, that's not the only thing that Jesus has to say against the church in Pergamos. He says, I have a few things against you, those who hold the doctrine of the D, or doctrine of Balaam, and those who hold the doctrine of Nicolaitans. Verse 15, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Now, this is the same group that is mentioned in uh, Revelation uh, chapter 2, earlier when it's sp speaking to the church of Ephesus. Nicolaitans, conquering the people. Uh, Nikos means to conquer or victorious, and Laos, people. Again, same word as Balaam, just the Greek, Greek version of that. And as we mentioned earlier, there's three views as to who these people, the Nicolaitans, were. They were either the first view, they were conquering the people, where they were removing the rights of the people, um, somewhat like a shepherding movement where the people had to ask the elder or the church or the, the pastor for the right to buy a car, buy a house, buy these things, and they had to give all their money to the church. Or the second group is just the opposite. They live however they want. And, um, <clears throat> and so the, the idea is that they were either domineering the people or they were living however they wanted to. Now, seeing how closely this group is related to 
the group of the ba uh, the doctrine of the Balaamites or Balaam, it would seem that they are more about living however they want. Notice, uh, whoever these this group is, the Nicolaitans, they were not good. Notice what William Barclay says. He says to John, the Nicolaitans were worse than the pagans, for they were the enemy within the gates. Another commentator says, the Nicolaitans were those who wished to compromise with the world. They were not prepared to be different. They were not prepared to make a great decision. They wished to have the best of both worlds. The fault of the Nicolaitans was that they were seeking to adjust Christianity to the level of the world, rather than to lift the world to the level of Christianity. And that's the, that's the, the problem, the difficulty of the doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Either way, they're trying to lift the standard of the world to the to or sorry they're trying to lift the standard of the church to the world rather than the the world um, to the church. They were taking the standard and changing it from hey we should be holy and righteous like God therefore let's make people or help people to be better. They were wanting to bring the church down to the level of the world. So. To the church of Ephesus, Christ said he was glad because they they heed, they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans along with the church of Ephesus. But the church of Pergamos, we see that they believe or hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. So they were going against the very thing that Christ hates. Also notice to the church of Ephesus, Jesus says they hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Whereas here, he the leader of the church... <clears throat> Here, Jesus tells the leader of the church that his people, the congregation, those within the church, are the ones that hold this doctrine. Now, there's a difference. Um, the difference would be that in Ephesus, the church identified the people who were acting not as they should, whereas in Pergamos, there was a teaching that was set to, up to justify those actions. So the difference is, in Ephesus, the church... They rejected those actions. They rejected those things. Whereas in Pergamos, there was actually a systematic doctrinal teaching that said sexual promiscuity and eating things sacrificed to idols was okay. They, they used scripture. It would seem they used scripture and doctrine to justify their sin within the church. Notice... The, this is the second time that Christ said, uses the word hate. Because notice in verse, uh, end of verse 15, uh, thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Second time Jesus uses it in the book of Revelation. The word hate means to, it's a strong word uh, with, with uh, uh, dislike or hate or the implication of a, aversion uh, and hostility and both times that this word is used is in direct connection with the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Also notice here in the letter to the church of Pergamos the doctrine of Balaam and that of the Nicolaitans again are closely related. Now we should mention something about about both of these before we move on. First Jesus has two things against this church. The doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Bol, bo, notice, both of these are doctrines. So they're teachings, they're systematic teachings of justification of their sin, of justifying that they, it is okay to sleep around and it is okay to eat things sacrificed to idols. But notice, who holds these doctrines? It is some. Now, the phrase, it is those who hold those doctrines. Jesus is concerned with the church because there are some within the church that hold these views. The church in general doesn't hold the view, but there are some that do. That is the compromise that Jesus is concerned about. He is concerned the compromise is not just that there are people that hold the doctrine, the compromise is that the leadership, the elders, the church government has allowed those to hold this doctrine to stay and remain within the church. Yes, there is a compromise in holding these doctrines. <clears throat> 
But there's a second compromise with the leadership, the elders, the pastor, allowing that doctrine and those who hold that doctrine to remain within the church. Even though he doesn't believe it, even though he may not hold it or agree with it, he's allowed them to remain within the church. What do I mean? Put it this way, say, say I'm the pastor of a church, and in my congregation I have people who believe it's okay to eat things sacrificed to idols as well as to sleep around with their boyfriend and girlfriend. But then I also have people in my congregation who do not eat things sacrificed to idols and do not believe it is okay to sleep around. I identify with this group that it's not right, it's not okay, but then I, I, I disagree with the group that believes things sacrificed to idols and, and sleeping around is okay. What do I do about it? If I was the pastor of the Church of Pergamos, I wouldn't be doing anything. I would be allowing them to stay within the church and to fellowship together. Now, why? some of you may be thinking, why is that wrong? Well, the difficulty, and notice one, is wrong because Jesus says it's wrong. But also, that is not living a lifestyle that is different to Christ. That is not living a lifestyle that is, sorry, different than the world that is like Christ. That is being one with the world, trying to be married, having a mixed marriage with the world. So not only are, the, are those that hold the doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of Nicolaitans trying to lower the standard of the church, but now the pastor is compromising within the confines of the church. The church is no longer a safe place. The church is no longer a place where we can be fellowshipping with like-minded people. Because now you have two groups that believe in different uh, opposing beliefs. Okay to sleep around, not okay to sleep around. So what do you do in the midst of that? You have to deal with one and put, and, and, and rightfully deal with them. And uh, we'll look at that in just a minute when Jesus says what to do. <clears throat> Sorry, that was a bit of a tangent. But the, the, the church, in, remember, the church in general doesn't hold this, but there are those who do. So the issue is that there are some that hold this view, but the church tolerates it or allows it within its borders. G. Kevin Morgan says the church was loyal to the mission of Christ and did not deny the faith, but what he had against them was that they were tolerating false views. What the church lacked was discipline. Jesus makes the distinction that some hold these views, but he also tells the church that they are in danger of tol for tolerating people who hold these views. So he, he's there, the fact that not only there are some that hold these views, but then the church allows them to stay within that church. So what does Jesus tell them to do? What is the, the correction or the thing that they need to do? Verse 16, repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So really, Jesus tells them to do one thing, repent. Now, repent means to change mind as a result of thought and attitude. Repent. Now, remember, it means to turn back, ask for forgiveness, be sorrowful, repent repentance, William Barclay put it this way, is the admission that the fault is ours and the repentance, or sorry, the experience of godly sorrow, that it is so. Remember, we, we looked at this in the Church of Ephesus. Repentance, true biblical repentance, has three components or three actions directly linked to it. And they're not necessarily in this order, but they are, uh, they do need to take place. First, there's a change of mind. We can stop sinning or stop going in the wrong direction, but if we do not acknowledge that we were wrong, then we have not truly repented. And secondly, it's a change of direction. We can acknowledge that we were wrong or that we sinned, but if we don't actually stop sinning, then we have not repented. Thirdly, a change of heart. If we do not, if, if we do not accept or change our heart about the actions, we are simply doing it because we have not, uh, because we, we have to, not because we want to or really think that we should. So we can agree with our mind that it is wrong. We could even stop that, uh, sinning, but if we don't ever change our heart about it, we are doing it because of compliance, not because of conviction.
And Jesus doesn't want compliance, he wants conviction. Because compliance just means we're going through the motions. We're doing what we're told, not because we want to, but because we have to. Convic conviction is doing what we want to do because we love Christ, we love those around us, and we believe that it is the right thing to do. Also notice the church of Pergamos is, is only told to do one thing. Repent. That's it. That's all they have to do is repent <clears throat> or else. That is, or else they will be dealt with. Notice as well, all uh, as well, no, <laughs> sorry, notice as well, who is told to repent? This is addressed to the whole church. Now think about that for a minute. Who holds the doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? Some. It is those who hold. But who's told to repent? Everyone. Why? Because everyone has allowed this doctrine to be within the church. It's not just those who hold those doctrine, and it's not just their fault. It's the church's fault for all continuing to allow them to be within the church walls. So we must ask, what was to be done? Well, the church was to stop tolerating these things. Truthfully, they needed to walk through Matthew 18. That if a brother sins against you, go to them in person. And if they will not hear you, bear one or two witnesses. And if they will not hear them, take it before the church leadership. And if they will not hear them, cast them out as an unbeliever. Matthew 18 is, is simply the process of working through uh, division within the body. Notice Jesus says, or else I will come and fight against them. Uh, <clears throat> he will fight them with the sword of his mouth, that judgment sword. What an influence of love, G. Cal Morgan says, what an influence of love behind this threat. It is as though the Lord would say, discipline these people for the judgment will be swift and heavy if they are not excluded. Simply deal with it. Matthew 18, handle these things. Confront the brethren. Notice verse 17 says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Same statement before, a command to all who hear. Again, that understanding that it is a, 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 applicable to us even today, thousands of years later. But then we come to verse 17. To him who overcomes, the victorious one, to him who is the victor, him who is uh, the conqueror. Notice what? The conqueror of what? Him who repents. Him who no longer holds to these doctrines. Who deals with that sin. But it says, To him who, excuse me, who overcomes, I will give the hidden manna. Oh, excuse me. Ooh, the hidden manna to eat. Now, so uh, those who overcome receive two things. They will be given a hidden manna and they will be given a white stone. Now, manna was honey-flavored bread given by God to Israel during the time of wilderness. Um, Exodus 16, verse 33, uh, we see that the Israelites are told to keep a jar of manna in the Ark of the Covenant as a reminder of God's provision. But then we also see in, in Joshua 5, verse 12, it says that the, that, the, that the manna stopped coming because the Israelites had started eating of the fruit of the promised land. So they were given this bread from heaven for about 40 years until they entered into the promised land. Now there's a legend about the Ark of the Covenant during the time of the destruction of the temple when the Babylonians took over. That when the temple was being destroyed, the one that Solomon built, Jeremiah took the jar of manna and hid it in the cleft in the side of a rock in Mount Sinai. And legend goes that when, the, when Messiah will come, Jeremiah will come also and will bring the manna and everyone will partake. So the Jew, for the Jew to partake of the hidden manna means that one would be partaking of the kingdom of the Messiah when the Messiah comes. For the Christian, it means a similar thing except that the Messiah will be returning for his bride and we will, re we will be rejoicing in the new kingdom. Another idea comes from John 6, verse 31 to 35. Jesus tells the Jews that their fathers had eaten bread in the wilderness, speaking of manna. But then Jesus claims, I am the bread of life. That if the bread of life and the hidden manna are the same, then this would be saying that 
we would not just be partaking of some bread, but we would be partaking of Jesus himself in the sense of being one with Christ. So here, the hidden manna could be we are being given Christ. We are being given him to those who are victorious. But then we have a white stone. We are given, those who are victorious are also given a white stone. Now, a white stone, there are several ideas about this white stone. And the idea is that, one of the ideas is that it's in the courtroom, they would, uh, um, they would use black and white stones to indicate uh, who uh, was innocent and who was guilty. The black stone was for the guilty and the white stone was for those innocent. And the jury would, uh, or those determining the case, would put the stone of the color uh, into a jar to indicate their vote. And the person... Uh, if they th uh, whether they thought they were innocent or guilty. And so uh, those they tally up the votes. The more stones meant that was the verdict. So black stones meant they were guilty. White stones meant they were innocent. Some believe these stones that are what have been called a tessera or tablets. Um, so another idea is that they were these tablets. So these stones were actually tablets or, or, or sort of like... Um, yeah, tablets probably a good way of doing it. They were made of wood, stone, or even metal. And there's three types of, of tablets that are described in, in the Greek times uh, or the Roman times. Uh, first, in the Roman houses, in the great houses, the houses of significant people, uh, there were these dependents who, who were taken care of by the wealthy citizens. And they would be given the, these dependents, whether they were children or, or people who just needed to be taken care of, uh, they would be given a tablet uh, on behalf of the citizen to prove that they could collect their livelihood or rather be taken care of. So it was almost as if there was a... Um, you know, if I was a dependent of someone wealthy and I would I would go to the grocery store and collect my goods and I would say, hey, here's, you know, the Smith's tablet and it shows that the Smiths will pay for my food. Um, <clears throat> the second is that in ancient Rome and Greek, there were they were known for their games. And as the victor, a champion of these games would be given a tablet to confirm that he had won the games. And as well as grant him entrance into all future games and entertainment activities. So it was sort of this access pass that, hey, I've won, I have access into these games. Third is that the Rome, they love their gladiators. We know that from the movie Gladiator as well as other Roman movies. Now, most gladiators would fight to the death and never accomplish much. But uh, every now and then there was a gladiator that would fight and become a hero of the spectators. And also the gladiators would grow old if they were if they were uh, good they would grow old and not die but they would become one of the favored and some would then ultimately be exempt from fighting because they were too old and too uh, well loved and, and they would be given a tablet with SP stamped on it SP stood for uh, Spectacus, which means a man whose valor has been proven beyond doubt. And so he'd be given this tablet to indicate that he was a man of valor, a man of worth, a man that had fought for his life in the games. And the idea behind all three of these types of tablets is that being given a white stone, we have everything provided for us. Our daily needs are taken care of in Christ. Our victor is Christ, and he has given us access to all heavenly things. And as a gladiator, he has proven his valor and has given us that honor. And so maybe these tablets are those things that we have. We are given this white stone with that uh, represents what Christ has done for us. But another idea on a white stone is a reference to an amulet that the heathens would wear. This amulet or necklace was to protect the people from the evil spirits and to have good health or other special benefits. And the secret was in the name of the God that was written on the necklace. And as long as no one knew the name of the God that was written on the necklace, then there was protection. And the idea is that Christ gives us most powerful necklace or amulet with his name on it, and we are always protected. The last idea, um, before we move on, is the this white stone is connected to the Urim and the Thurim of the Old Testament priesthood. We see this in Exodus 20, 28, verse 15 and verse 30, Leviticus 8, 8, and Numbers 27, 21, even Deuteronomy 33, verse 8. These stones were used to determine the will of God by the leaders of Israel. 
And the high priest would intercede for the leaders and he, uh, who could not approach God directly. John MacArthur said, according to this view, by this, the white stone of God, uh, God promises to overcome knowledge of his will. So we're given the, this uh, stone so that we can know the knowledge of God's will. Now, <clears throat> the thing is, we need to look at the significance of the stone. Notice what it says in Revelation. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone the, a new name, uh, which no one knows, or sorry, a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. So the significance of the stone is really nothing. The stone is nothing more than a messenger. We see that the significance has less to do with the stone than it does with the name that is on the stone. The significance, I think, is more on the name than it is on the stone itself. There is a name on this stone which no one knows except the one who receives it. So the stone simply is that. It's a white stone. But notice the name. It's a new name. It's a name, and what, what's, the, what's the significance of names? Well, names give importance. Sometimes it identifies. Sometimes it, it talks about reputation, acceptance. There's importance. There's relevance. There's identity. There's even worth in a name. Value within a name. But no one, know, no one knows the name except the one who receives it. We're the only ones who know that name. Whether that name is relevant to us or that name is relevant to Christ, we will only find out when we receive that stone. They're special and significant only to the ones who receive it because they're the only ones who know what the name is. Christ sees that, th that we need a new name and that name should be in him. Something else to consider for those who, for whose name is on the stone is again, we don't know. First, it doesn't tell us. Second, it says only the one who receives it, meaning that it could be Christ's name or it could be the name of the person. We don't know. So with that, we begin to wrap up. And uh, my encouragement to you at this point in time is to not compromise. Don't allow people to hold these doctrines, to hold these things and entice you into them. Now, what do I mean? Because there's a balance here. <clears throat> we, we are not called to be the doctrinal police of Christianity. That's not our role. So we, we shouldn't and, and cannot go around pointing the finger at everyone who doesn't believe what we believe or believes differently. That would not be loving. That would not be caring. That would not be uh, what Christ would want us to do. But there's a difference between being the doctrinal police and identifying those that are in your body, in your church, in your group of believers that hold a different doctrine, that hold a dangerous doctrine. It's one thing to um, point out every uh, flaw within a person, and it's another to identify a false doctrine. My encouragement to you would be to make sure, one, you're not holding any false doctrine. You're not holding anything that could be compromising to your walk with the Lord. Secondly, make sure that, that, you, that those that you fellowship with don't hold to compromising doctrines. Don't hold to things that are in line with sexual immorality or even uh, eating things sacrificed to idols. Now, I know those are Old Testament terms or, or you know, Jesus terms, if you will. But the reality is, is, are we doing things with our boyfriends or girlfriends that we shouldn't be doing? Are we living a way in which is proper and holy to the Lord? Or do we justify those things within our mind? Do we try to justify the way we live so that we can live that way? Or are we open before the Lord, open before the Word of God, and open before others? If our pastor or uh, mom or dad or, or a loved one came to us and said, Hey, how's your relationship with so-and-so? Or why are you doing this? Would you be embarrassed? Or could you tell them openly that I do this because I believe it's right? And here's the scriptures to back it up. That's my encouragement to you today. With that, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for this time. I pray that you speak to us and uh, 
let us uh, just be encouraged in these things to not be compromising in your word. We thank you and pray. Amen. Thanks, guys. We'll see you later.